Good morning, everybody. Welcome to PCH Grand Rounds. Happy Tuesday morning. We will introduce our speakers in just a moment, Dr. Kelly Kelleher and Dr. Jamie Liberzi. Uh, but before we do that, we have a little bit of business to go over. Uh, we are uh, excited this morning to pilot a couple new things at Grand Rounds. The first is that uh, we will be, in the future, um, actually streaming Grand Rounds live on a YouTube, uh, a PCH YouTube channel. Um, we are not going to stream it live this morning. We don't have that capability yet, but we are going to um, store the archive of this presentation on YouTube. And we don't have the link for that yet, but when we do get the link, um, we will uh, make that available. Uh, so for a while, we'll just be storing the archives, but eventually we'll be able to actually stream it live uh, on uh, YouTube. Um, secondly, uh, what we are going to do this morning for the first time is actually be able to provide MOC Part 2 credit uh, for those who are board certified under the uh, American uh, uh, Board of Pediatrics, uh, ABP. So we are going to do this through uh, a, a Poll Everywhere multiple choice question. We have used Poll Everywhere before in Grand Rounds, uh, and that's always a, a fun interaction when we do that. Uh, and we, uh, our speakers have several questions today throughout the presentation uh, that are going to be, we're going to use the live audience response system for, but it's not till the question at the end uh, that we will give the MOC Part 2 credit for. And uh, just a little bit of background quickly on the MOC Part 2 credit. Um, the ACCME, which is the accreditation body that allows us to give CME credit, and the ABP, American Board of Pediatrics, very recently announced a collaboration by which uh, as long as a, an educational event meets criteria for CME, uh, it can also meet criteria for MOC Part 2. And all we have to do uh, in addition is to add what they call an evaluation mechanism, which uh, was what we used to call a test when I was in school. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to be extensive or, you know, it can be very uh, simple and straightforward. But um, so we will hopefully on, uh, you know, the majority of grand rounds going forward, add a question at the end um, uh, for you. And if you answer it correctly, you will get MOC Part 2 credit. And the last thing I will say on that is that uh, initially we thought we'd be able to offer one point per grand <coughs> rounds. And uh, as we learned more, we found out that we can only offer one amount of uh, credit per calendar year per event. And that may not have made much sense, but basically we had to figure out an amount that we could uh, allow you to, to get uh, per year for grand rounds. We came up with the number 10, uh, 10 MOC part two credit uh, points. Um, and so basically, if you answer 10 points correctly over the course of a year, we will give you, uh, through the ABP, 10 points. If you get more than 10 points or more than 10 questions, uh, you can't get any more than 10 points. And if you get less than 10 questions, we can't give you any points. So 10 is the magic number, but we thought that that was a very uh, practical and doable amount. And you only need... 40 points every five year cycle. So if you get 10 points per year, it's a very, uh, I think, uh, helpful and practical amount to get. So we're trying this out today. Uh, uh, bear with us. Uh, hopefully it goes well. Um, and hopefully uh, starting with this grand round set in the future, we'll have uh, an MOC uh, question offered at each grand rounds. Um, all right, so actually we should practice uh, the poll everywhere because we'll, we'll have a few questions as we go through the, uh, the lecture. So pull out your cell phones, and uh, um, if you can text 22333, uh, or, or text to the number 22333, and you're going to, the content you're going to text is PCH MedEd, and just press send, and you'll get a message back that you'll, you see here with the message you'll get. And if you, once you do that, you are ready to go. And as soon, once we get to the first question, um, you'll just be able to press in the, the letter and you'll see it on the screen live, your responses coming in uh, and we'll see uh, how you guys are doing with the questions. So again, we'll have several questions as we go through the uh, presentation. 
and it's only the last question uh, that actually we'll use for MOC Part 2 credit. If you get that MOC Part 2 credit uh, question wrong, uh, don't worry. Uh, we will go through the right answer, and you'll get a second chance to, uh, to answer it. All right, um, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and um, again, we'll, we'll kind of go through these instructions as we go through the presentation. So this morning, Dr. Jamie Labrizzi and Dr. Kelly Kelleher are going to speak on neonatal fever. Dr. Labrizzi um, is the current fellowship director in, uh, of the Pediatric Hospitalist Medicine Program, and Dr. Kelleher is the interim division chief uh, of, the, um, of the Kids Lift Division. So without further ado, I will welcome uh, our presenters this morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. So Jamie and I are going to be talking about um, the current uh, practice patterns and the management and uh, evaluation of neonatal fever today. Um, neither one of us have any disclosures that we need to um, communicate with you. So briefly, you know, today's objectives um, are to revert, review the current literature regarding neonatal fever management, uh, discuss trends in hospitalist management of neonatal fever, and then discuss our local efforts in the management of febrile neonates. So we're hoping we can have a lot of interaction today with our audience and um, I think just to help us get an idea of who's here today and what, what um, uh, who's participating, um, we're just gonna start off with some easy questions hopefully. So yes or no, do you care for patients with neonatal fever? One or two or? I think A or B. So there's your stuff. Yeah, so everyone, if you start responding, you can either be texting and text the 22333 and then your response to you can text either A or B or whatever options are on the screen. Okay, 
Um, so great. So hopefully we'll be able to have a good discussion because it looks like most people here do care for infants with neonatal fever. Um, and then secondly, what's what's your role? What kind of closest matches how you view yourself? Great. So I'm expecting the residents to get these most of these questions correct because they've heard this once before, so we'll see here. Um, so just a lighthearted quote to kind of start things off. So since the advent of modern clinical uh, thermometry by Wonderlich in 1871, the ritual of temperature taking has been surpassed only by Alexander Graham Bell. Graham Bell's invention in uh, 1874 as a major curse of pediatrics. So those 2 a.m. phone calls of you know, my son or daughter hasn't had a bowel movement today, what should I do? Uh, no, just, again, lighthearted to get us started off. So I think, you know, in um, kind of setting the stage, uh, what is the most common etiology of bacteremia in, neon in neonates as, as you understand currently? So it looks like GBS is emerging as, um, as the most popular choice with E. coli, a uh, distant second, I will say. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is, you know, what are those bacterial pathogens in our neonates? So I think historically, unless you've been, unless you're currently in medical school or recently graduated from medical school, I feel like um, it was standard teaching that viral causes were the most common you know, followed by uh, groupie strep, E. coli, and listeria in that order. But we know that things are changing. Um, most recently, um, in the last several years, there have been multiple studies that have come out kind of investigating different, um, the most common etiologies of bacterial pathogens. I think one of the most notable studies recently was a study done by Biondi. It was published in Pediatrics in 2013. And this was a case that, um, where they reviewed over almost 3,000 positive blood cultures. Um, and they excluded um, uh, 1,800 of them because they were taken from uh, neonates that were in ICU settings, and then had to exclude another 800 because they were deemed to be um, not pathologic for uh, contaminants. And I think that that's an important theme that's gonna recur throughout our talk today is that um, there is a large percentage of contaminants when we're culturing um, this patient population. So they were left with 181 samples uh, to analyze, and within that they found that E. coli was the cause, um, uh, or was the offending pathogen 42% of the time, GBS 23% uh, of the time, and then much uh, lower uh, percentages included strep pneumo, um, staph aureus, both MSSA and MRSA, Klebsiella, and then also important to note, there were no cases of listeria reported um, in this study. All right, so um, we're not gonna uh, uh, have another question. So we're gonna start off with a case here. So you have a 34 day old full term male um, presenting with fever and fussiness. Um, these are the initial labs um, that you get in the ER. So white count of 12, a UA with five whites, um, no uh, leukosterase or nitrates. CSF has eight whites, uh, glucose 25, protein 10, your blood culture is pending. Um, so um, I'm interested to see what criteria you guys use um, to determine whether the patient is high risk or low risk for a serious bacterial infection. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so it looks like the majority of people are, are um, using the Rochester criteria um, with a fair percentage of you, about a third of you, um, using your own clinical judgment. Um, uh, so I want to take a moment just to kind of go over some of the history of how um, the, uh, these criteria have evolved over the years. Um, so prior to 1985, um, it was recommended that all infants less than 60 days presenting with fever undergo a full septus workup including um, empiric antibiotics and hospitalization. And this is because at that time, the criteria um, used to identify high-risk infants were insufficiently sensitive um, to identify infants um, who had serious bacterial infections. Um, but this approach you know, uh, definitely had the downside or disadvantage of uh, significant uh, unnecessary hospitalizations, uh, adverse uh, effects from antibiotics, nosocomial infections, uh, as well as the emergence of resistant bacteria. Um, so since 1985, there's now been several institutions that have released pretend, uh, criteria in an effort to identify patients who are low risk of serious bacterial infection uh, in the hope that it could provide some reassurance to providers um, to uh, have a more limited approach in terms of uh, workup and management of these kids. Um, so like I said, I'm going to briefly kind of go through um, these criteria. So the first one in 1985 that came out was the Rochester criteria, which I think is probably one of the better known um, and more commonly referenced criteria, um, as we just saw um, here. And so um, in order for a patient to be considered low risk, they had to meet all of, all of these um, uh, criteria. So previously healthy without previously erratic use, a normal exam, a white count of five, between 5 to 15, band count less than 1,500, and a UA with less than 10 white blood cells. Um, they then updated this uh, uh, criteria to include that if the diarrhea was present, um, the stool white blood cell count um, had to be less than 10. Following that, Boston, 1992 Boston release criteria. Um, some notable differences in their criteria is that they, um, their white count cutoff was less than 20 um, without any sort of band criteria. Um, they included that there could be no Luke esterase present on the UA, and then they um, felt as that all infants presenting should have uh, CSF studies done um, with a white blood, CSF white blood cell count less than 20 to be considered low risk. Following that, in 1993, Milwaukee and Philadelphia both released criteria. Um, the Milwaukee criteria, um, they lowered the white blood cell um, count uh, cutoff to less than 15. Um, they added, no, in addition to no leukosterase, also no nitrates on the UA, and they lowered the CSF uh, white blood cell count off, uh, uh, cutoff to less than 10 cells. Um, the Philly criteria, um, they further lowered the CSF white blood cell count to less than eight, and then they also included a subjective um, infant observation score in an effort to try to uh, identify uh, kind of clinically sick uh, infants. Then, um, oops, sorry. So then in um, 1994, um, the Rochester further modified their criteria to include um, inflammatory markers as part of their workup. Following that, in 1999, uh, Philadelphia uh, released a second version of, of their criteria. Um, they included a band and neutrophil ratio of less than 0.2. Um, and again, their CSF uh, cutoff for white blood cells was less than 8 uh, with the uh, observation score. And then finally, in 2001, Pittsburgh released um, the criteria. Um, they uh, utilized a white, uh, white count cutoff of less than 15. They decreased the UA um, cutoff to less than nine whites and then further decreased the CSF cutoff to less than five white blood cells. Uh, so that kind of brings us up to um, the present. Um, so as you can see, um, over the course of the years, um, it has become much harder to meet the low risk criteria. Um, so the sensitivity has definitely improved. Um, but the criteria have now gotten so strict with so many additional criteria added um, that uh, they estimate about 70% of febrile infants uh, presenting will not meet low risk criteria. <clears throat> so while we can be a little bit more sure about the risk in this low risk um, group, we now have a much larger group um, in which we don't have much information to guide our clinical management. Um, and therefore, ultimately, kind of falls on the individual provider to decide what degree of diagnostic uncertainty they're willing to tolerate at risk of missing a potential bacterial um, infection. And I think this is what we find is really now driving a lot of the practice variation that we see um, with this patient population. Um, so as I mentioned, though, we do have, you know, a fair amount of information about these low-risk um, uh, infants. 
um, with the release of all these proposed guidelines, there's actually been a fair amount of uh, research um, attempting to validate um, the use of these criteria to risk stratify. Um, so uh, Hepler provided this uh, literature review back in 2010, um, evaluating the performance of low risk criteria for um, uh, a risk stratification. So this uh, table summarizes the prospective uh, studies in which low risk infants um, uh, were managed with observation only. Um, so you can see in that second column, um, that's the criteria that each individual study used to risk satisfy their patients. Um, in total, uh, there were uh, 1,858 uh, patients included across all the studies. 988 patients um, were identified as a high risk per the criteria used. Um, with, uh, of those patients, 168 patients were ultimately uh, identified as having a serious bacterial infection. Um, there were 870 uh, patients who were identified as low risk across these studies. Um, and of those 870 <coughs> low risk patients, only six were found to have um, uh, actual uh, bacterial infection. Notably, there are no cases of bacterial meningitis in those patients. Uh, two cases of bacteremia and uh, four cases of uh, urinary tract infections, one of which was diagnosed as a, with a bag specimen, so it's you know, questionable. Um, all six of those patients um, who had a bacterial infection identified, um, who had initially just had been observed, uh, all received treatment and uh, recovered uneventfully. Um, so the conclusions of this uh, lit review um, was that careful application of the current low, uh, uh, low risk criteria is an effective way to identify children in whom um, empiric antibiotics and possible hospitalization um, could be withheld. Okay, so next case. Um, so you have a 20-day-old full-term male presenting with fever and increased rigor breathing. Um, exam was consistent with bronchiolitis and rapid viral testing was positive for RSV. So what workup would you pursue? So again, 20 day old with fever and bronchiolitis. Okay, so it looks like um, the majority, vast majority of you would pursue a limited workup, um, including CBC, blood and urine, but hold the LP with no antibiotics. Um, and then a small percentage would still pursue the full workup, including LP and antibiotics, um, and 10% of you would um, have a source. Um, so um, that's interesting. So let's talk about bronchiolitis season. So, um, you know, I think in the management of these um, kids presenting with fever, the questions always emerge on how do we um, uh, handle viral infections um, in kids that we are potentially wanting to rule out a, a serious bacterial infection. Um, there's actually also been a fair amount of research done on this topic as well. And this is uh, one commonly cited um, article, at least in the hospitalist world, um, by um, Byington, um, which was published back in 2004. Um, and uh, this study uh, evaluated uh, serious bacterial infections in febrile infants uh, ages 1 to 90 days with and without viral infections. Um, and so uh, 1,385 infants um, who presented with fever and had viral testing performed uh, were included. Um, and so they found that the occurrence of uh, serious bacterial infections in infants with viral infections were significantly lower than those without viral infections, um, 4.2 versus 12.3. Uh, um, percent. And then notably, um, there was no cases of bacterial meningitis in any of the infants um, with a, a, a viral infection. Um, so in this study, they utilized the Rochester criteria to risk satisfy their patients. Um, and they found that low risk infants who are virus positive um, were the least likely to have a serious bacterial infection. Uh, low risk infants who are viral negative um, were next followed by high risk um, infants who were virus positive. Um, and then lastly, high-risk uh, infants who are viral negative. Um, and so the occurrence of a serious bacterial infection in the low-risk virus positive infants and low-risk virus negative um, infants were not statistically different, um, but uh, high-risk high virus positive infants were significantly less likely to have a serious bacterial infection than high-risk virus negative um, infants, 5.5 um, versus 16.7%. 
So it's still notable that you know of our, our high risk um, uh, infants that had virus positive, 5.5% of them still did have a, a bacterial infection. The vast majority of those cases were urinary tract infections. Um, so. Um, and then they found that the high risk virus positive infants actually had similar rates of uh, bacteremia um, as those uh, infants that were classified as low risk. Um, so this study suggests that the use of viral testing in combination with the Rochester criteria can substantially um, improve the ability um, for uh, clinicians to risk satisfy um, uh, these infants. So what about RSVs um, in particular? We're kind of right in the middle of that season right now. Um, and so this is another uh, uh, commonly cited uh, article by Levine, uh, also published in 2004. Um, and this is a prospective cross-sectional uh, cross study. Um, it included 1,248 infants, of which 269 of them um, had documented RSV um, infections. And they found that the RSV positive infants were less likely to have a serious bacterial infection compared to RSV negative um, infants. Um, again, RSV positive infants had no cases of bacterial meningitis um, identified. Um, and RSV positive infants did have lower rates of bacteremia, although this did not reach statistical significance when compared to RSV negative um, uh, infants. Um, but in a multivariable analysis, um, they did find that an RSV uh, infection was associated with a lower risk of uh, um, a serious bacterial infection after adjusting for age, temperature, a Yale, uh, the Yale observation score, and um, a peripheral white blood cells count. Um, and then when they stratified by age, the overall rate of serious bacterial infection um, in those infants um, that were less than 28 days did not differ significantly between those that were RSV positive and RSV negative. But in the older age groups, those infants 29 to uh, 60 days, um, there was a statistical difference um, in, in the rates of SBI of those who were and were not infected with RSV. So the RSV negative um, infants had a rate of SBI of 5.5% versus 11.7% um, for those that are RSV negative. So again, the study um, further supports the use of viral testing, um, you know, in conjunction with risk stratification or using criteria to risk stratify um, infants. So these are just a couple of um, many um, kind of studies that have been done on this topic recently. Um, additional work has been done on the etiology of common bacterial pathogens, which Kelly just reviewed. Um, time to culture of positivity, which we're gonna review a little bit uh, later in this uh, presentation. Some cost savings data, as well as using uh, work done at other centers, most notably at Intermountain um, Healthcare. It's done a lot of work um, uh, on this topic. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result of all this recent literature, um, the ADP has decided to update the guidelines on the management of the febrile uh, infants. Um, so they have new guidelines that are anticipated to be released in early 2017. So any day now we're waiting. Um, uh, we got kind of a sneak peek of it at our, our last uh, hospice uh, national meeting. Um, so there's, like, there's been a lot of work uh, put into this. Um, so some of the notable updates that uh, we're going to see um, in these guidelines is that they're going to now uh, have recommendations um, to stratify management by age. Um, so that you're 7 to 28 days, you're 29 to 60 days, and then 61 to 90 days. Um, they're going to introduce a role for use of inflammatory markers um, uh, as part of the workup, as well as proposing uh, withholding uh, treatment and procedures for low-risk infants. Um, so in the meantime, while we wait for um, those guidelines to officially be released, um, there is a National Quality Improvement Collaborative um, that is um, being uh, uh, done that's called Project Revise, um, which stands for uh, Reducing Excessive Variability in Infant Sepsis Evaluation, and this is being sponsored by the Value and Inpatient Pediatric Network. Um, unfortunately, uh, PCH has been um, invited to uh, be a part of. So we are one of 135 teams across um, the country um, who are involved in this um, study and we're the only institution um, in Arizona uh, participating. Um, and so the aim of this uh, project is um, to provide a multidisciplinary team uh, with quality improvement education and tools specific to the management of children with fever to increase compliance with the evidence-based research and decrease the overuse of non-evidence-based therapies and tests. And more specifically, um, our hope um, through this project is to decrease admission for infants presenting to the ED with fever for a low risk of bacterial infection, decreasing variation in care of febrile infants presenting to the ED, 
um, decreasing length of stay, as well as decreasing the use of unnecessary chest x-rays um, in the care um, of these febrile infants. Um, so here at PCH, uh, we've assembled a core working group um, uh, composed of uh, uh, providers um, from the ED, our hospitalist group, uh, nursing, um, as well as we have several residents um, involved as well. Um, and so as kind of our first, you know, we just kind of got this going at the beginning of this year. Um, and so um, we're currently promoting the use of our own PCH neonatal pathway, um, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, in this presentation. Um, we're doing uh, data collection each month of, of our specific outcome measures um, and so that we can trend our, our local trends here at our institution, um, as well as compare our, our outcomes to, uh, nationally to the other institutions that are participating in this study. Um, and then we'll, uh, we hope to kind of go through several PDSA cycles over the next um, year and a half or so um, to help standardize the care that we're providing for these infants here. Um, so Kelly, based on um, some of the recommendations coming through revised, Kelly's going to review what the current management recommendations are. So we've included the colored algorithms in your packet, so that's what we're going to go through now. It's going to be a little bit challenging to read up on the screen. Um, but for those infants who are less than seven days of age, the, um, the recommendation is still to do everything that we would traditionally do for infants undergoing sepsis evaluation. So this would include a CBC with differential, a blood culture, a urinary, a urine analysis, urine culture, um, lumbar puncture with a CSL cell count, protein and glucose, CSF culture, and then we'll touch on HSV a, a little bit further um, down the line. So really, um, there isn't much uh, variation in, in this patient uh, age group, and so we'll spend the majority of the time talking about um, infants less than 28 days of age and then those that are 29 to 60 days of age. So for the infants who are 7 to 28 days of age, the recommendation um, is a little bit modified compared to what I think most of us traditionally think of when we have an infant who presents with fever. So they're still recommending uh, CBC with differential. Uh, they're recommending to obtain a blood culture. And then what's uh, new is the use of inflammatory markers. So obtaining a CRP or procalcitonin, uh, urine analysis, urine culture, and then a respiratory PCR to help um, identify a viral etiology. Once you have those tests obtained, and I will say, I mean, this is not to replace clinical judgment in an infant who is, you know, sick appearing, obviously, you would want to treat them um, as if they were critically ill. This is really to help stratify those low and high risk infants who are well appearing on your initial exam. So once you obtain the initial um, uh, laboratory data, um, then the hope is that you can stratify them into a lower high risk. Um, and so there's a bacterial infection checklist on each algorithm, and they are just a little bit different. For the infants who are 7 to 28 days of age, um, there are historical questions on there. So were they born premature? Um, do they have a history of unexplained hyperbilirubinemia? Have they received prior antibiotics? But then also you'll see some similar themes to what Jamie presented earlier going back, you know, through some of the um, older criteria such as the Rochester criteria, is their white blood cell count less than 5,000 or greater than 15,000? You know, is, what is their band count? Um, and so based on uh, whether or not they meet lower or high-risk criteria, if they meet high-risk criteria, the recommendation is to perform a lumbar puncture, administer antibiotics, and then observe, uh, admit them to the hospital for further evaluation and management. For those who are meeting low-risk criteria, um, there's a point in the algorithm that says, you know, are you going to make the decision to administer antibiotics? If the answer is yes, you, the recommendation is you should do that lumbar puncture. Um, but in most cases, infants who are low risk should not be undergoing a lumbar puncture. Um, antibiotics should not be administered, but the recommendation is to admit that patient for antibiotics, or sorry, for observation. No antibiotics. Um, and then this is just the algorithm. I'm not going to go through the bottom portion um, right now, but it is there for your reference. Um, and then when we transition to those infants who are a little bit older, so that 29 to 60 day, um, day of age, um, the initial uh, workup is the same. So CBC with differential, blood culture, CRP or procalcitonin, 
urine analysis, urine culture, and a respiratory PCR. Um, what's interesting and what we you know, discussed on uh, the National Collaborative Listserv is that they're instructing us to get inflammatory markers, but yet they're not telling us what to do with that information. So that didn't make the bacterial infection checklist. I don't know if it was an oversight or just or purposeful. We've been treating it uh, the same for both age groups. So if they are elevated um, in either age group, we're treating that as uh, flagging them towards high risk. But you can also see, you know, do they have a chronic illness? Have they received prior antibiotics? Um, some of the same themes, and then um, the CDC uh, white blood cell count um, criteria is similar, same with uh, band media. So again, if they're high risk, a lumbar puncture should be performed, antibiotics should be administered, and the infant should be admitted for treatment. Um, if they're low risk, um, then the decision is made on whether or not um, the infant is safe to discharge home. And we'll talk a little bit more about how infants need to meet discharge, discharge criteria. But in these infants that are low risk, um, you're not going to perform a lumbar puncture on them, you're not administering antibiotics, um, they can be safely discharged home. And we'll talk about what things need to be in place to make that happen. Um, and it's the green box on this algorithm that goes over a little bit of the discharge criteria. I'm not going to spend a, a ton of, of time on this um, in conjunction with our infectious disease um, team when we first um, developed our neonatal pathway. We did develop some antibiotic guidelines. There are no um, hard guidelines uh, currently by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, in seven days of age, uh, we are currently doing ampicillin and cephalotaxime. Ampicillin and gentamicin is a very reasonable alternative. We're not saying that it's not. Um, same for those infants, 7 to 28 days of age. And then in the older group, um, uh, Cetrax on the loan um, we should be sufficient. Obviously, if there's concern for meningitis, then we should always think about adding um, vancomycin. Um, and we'll kind of uh, skip over the fact that we're in the middle of a cephotaxine shortage, but again, we can discuss that um, towards the end. So our next question is, you're following a 14-day-old female with RSV bronchiolitis uh, who presented to the <coughs> emergency department the evening prior with a temperature of 38.3. The patient met low-risk criteria, blood and urine cultures or no growth at 24 hours, and respiratory status is reassuring on room air. Um, what do you decide to do? So it looks like half are would discharge, um, and uh, about a third of you would monitor um, until cultures are negative at 36 hours. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. So recently, there's been several studies discussing um, time to detection for um, both blood culture positivity as well as CSF and urine culture positivity. So I think you know the most. Um, one of the most um, cited studies recently was a study done by Evans that was published in Hospital Pediatrics in 2013. So this was a study where they uh, reviewed 283 charts um, and specifically for blood culture results. So that they were able to review 101 uh, blood culture results that were, again, true pathogens, not contaminants. So the mean time to detection was 13.3 uh, hours. And 97% of those true positives were identified by 36 hours. Um, and of note, if the time to detection was greater than uh, 36 hours, it was 7.8 times more likely that it was going to be a contaminant. Um, for the urine culture uh, specimens, the mean time to detection was 21 hours, and 95% of true positives were identified by 36 hours. And then for CSF uh, cultures, the mean time to detection was 28.9 hours, and 86% of true positives were identified by 36 hours. So this um, study helped um, start to push the envelope towards discharging these patients a little bit early. Um, and people were aiming to get um, patients discharged around that 36 hour mark. 
Then in uh, 2014, Bianchi came out with a study that was published in JAMA where he evaluated almost 400 um, positive blood cultures um, from around the United States. And his findings were very similar. He didn't look at urine or CSF cultures, but in terms of um, blood cultures only, um, he found that the mean time to detection was 15.41 hours, so again, similar, and that 91% of true positives were detected within 24 hours, 96% um, by 36 hours, and then 99% um, by 48 hours. So what does this mean for discharge timing? So, um, you know, our, the re our recommendation is that if, if there's concern for CSF pleocytosis, these patients really should be monitored for, the, for that full 48 hours, unless of course you're able to identify a different etiology. Um, so in the middle of enterovirus season, if you're able to get that you know, viral PCR back that, that your patient has um, enterovirus um, meningitis, I think that that's a different situation. But if you don't have an etiology, just because the risk is higher, the time to detection is a little bit longer, these infants really should be observed on antibiotics for 48 hours. And again, I think we have to think about how these cultures are actually um, monitored. So um, most centers now have continuous blood culture monitoring. So um, with a biofire, you know, if anything's growing, it'll signal right away to the lab. So blood cultures can be monitored continuously. CSF and urine cultures still take, you know, a lab um, technician to look at them. Most centers do um, once a day. Some centers do. Um, more than that, but it's important to know at your institution when they're looked at, how often they're looked at, and that just because you come in in the morning and it's been 24 hours and you don't see um, anything reported for your CSF or urine culture results, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a true negative. It might just mean that um, the lab person hasn't checked that specimen for the day. Um, for infants who meet low risk criteria, um, we are moving towards discharge at 24 hours if the cultures are no growth. And then for high risk infants without CSF pleocytosis, um, we're moving towards discharging at 36 hours if the cultures are no growth. But I think it's important to consider um, uh, what needs to be in place to safely discharge a patient. And so some of the things um, that both um, the AAP is recommending and that we have implemented at our institution is, you know, does the, um, does the patient have an ability to follow up with their pediatrician or their uh, primary caregiver in the community in 24 hours? This can pose a problem on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and so sometimes we will admit those infants for observation if we can't guarantee that they'll be able to have follow up. Um, is there a system in place uh, for, back, for the bacterial culture results to be followed by the institution in which they were obtained and then easily call the family if something were to um, come up as positive? Do the parents have transportation? So if the child is discharged and then becomes ill, are they able to get back easily? And do they have a reliable means of communication? Um, I think it's also important to know, you know, how is the infant doing? Are they well appearing, you know, eating? Um, normally, and then are the parents comfortable with discharge? Um, sometimes, you know, parents just aren't comfortable even though they have met low risk criteria and then we would admit for observation. Um, briefly, I just wanted to um, touch on our own uh, PCH length of stay data compared to FIS, which is the um, national database for children's hospitals. So um, FIS is the red line and the PCH um, data is the blue line. And this is um, average length of stay. So you can see this is, it's hard to see, but quarter one of 2014. So we were above um, two days um, back then, right around 2.3 um, days for our length of stay. And over time, we've started to see a trend down. Um, you know, my hope is that we could get somewhere close to this 1.5 days for length of stay because we are going to have those infants that need to stay the full 48 hours. Um, but similarly, we should have a fair percentage of patients that we're going to be able to discharge closer to that um, 24 hour mark. And I think, you know, we can also gain too that this is a national trend where people are, are starting to discharge their these infants. Um, uh, much earlier than we have in the past. Um, but despite all this work, we do have some knowledge gaps that still exist. So, um, you know, HSV, I think, still remains um, a little bit of a, um, of a quandary. I mean, 
there aren't really hard and fast guidelines on when to test for HSV, when to treat. I feel like skin vesicles and seizures are a no-brainer, um, but, but you know, for those patients who are less than or equal to um, 42 days of age, you know, maternal history, which we all know is not all that reliable, um, there has been evidence that shows if you have elevated um, ASD ALT or CSF pleocytosis. Um, here we are not testing for HSV on every single infant that presents with um, fever. It's different in that less than um, uh, seven days of age category, but again, um, I don't think that the, the, the recommendation or guidelines um, that we have are strong um, either way. And then here at um, PCH, we do have some work to do on our neonatal fever pathway. So our pathway was um, implemented in December of 2015. Um, it does not take into account the inflammatory marker piece. Um, and so we do have some updating to do to um, more closely match what is being um, recommended by the VIP network. So that was all that we have. I don't know if we want to take questions now or go to the MOC question. Okay. Happy to take any questions that you guys have. Yes, so our pathway, so the um, question was, can you comment on the use of the CMP of the CMP in, in the initial evaluation? So our pathway does recommend a CMP. Um, the, the new guideline that um, has come out does not recommend that um, as a hard and fast recommendation. They have a separate box and it's orange on the algorithm um, as you know, kind of an HSV screening tool. Um, and if you're concerned, then you should proceed with the CMP. But again, it, it isn't a hard and fast recommendation. So the, the data, the length of stay data that was presented is if they're crossing a midnight. Um, but in the per, as part of the collaborative, we're reviewing cases each month and we're actually counting hours from time of admission um, to time of discharge order. And so we're trying to better capture what our actual performance is. Um, and I will say, you know, I think it's still, we're seeing more of a mix because I agree, it used to be that all patients were admitted under the inpatient category. I think if infants are meeting high-risk criteria and they're being put on antibiotics, they're still coming in as inpatient. If we're admitting them and not um, administering antibiotics and truly observing them, then they're being changed to observation status. Are you seeing consistency in that in terms of how it's being provided? Because we have that issue all the time. And, um, you know, one insurance company saying, no, this is still observating even if they're on antibiotics. And, um, Completely agree. Seeing similar things here as well. There's a, you know, obviously a national trend towards trying to um, have cost savings and do things more efficiently. That is probably much more prevalent than it was 20, 30 years ago when some of the initial studies were done. Um, and there's a cost for doing all this. There's it seems like a medical cost in that. There's kids who get antibiotics. Um, 
you know, unnecessarily show the making some uh, adverse effect of that later on or, or currently. And there's obviously a financial cost to doing all this. So it seems like you can get all the data in the world, but there's still going to be a subjective decision that can be made how much cost we're willing to pay for, you know, per uh, how many bacterial infections we're going to miss. And that that's somebody's got to make a decision there. Is that um, kind of where, what we're comfortable with? Has that changed over time? So I think it's starting to evolve, and I think probably one of the strongest argu arguments against um, following some of what um, is coming out is that theoretical possibility that you're going to miss a case of meningitis or SBI. I will say that in the um, Intermountain data, so they had a pathway similar to this um, that they studied that, um, for two years when some of this stuff was coming out, and they didn't miss a single case of meningitis. We've had similar findings here. We haven't missed a single a single case of meningitis, but um, they, there are on occasion, we do miss um, bacteremia. Um, they have done some cost analysis um, data uh, that has been published and it is significant cost savings. And I think um, part of it too is when you add on um, some of those repeat cultures because you've cultured the infant and then you have a contaminant or um, you know thinking about their IV infiltrated and now you're doing extra care because of that. Um, I think the cost savings piece is um, definitely under much more scrutiny than it has been in the past. And they have shown you know, substantial cost savings, but um, at the end of the day, I think all of us would agree that we would want to do the right thing for the patient, irrespective of um, you know, saving money or not. If we were at all concerned, we would keep an additional hospital stay, better hospital stay. By the way, uh, nice job, very great presentation. Um, I just have two comments. So there's starting to be a separate vaccine shortage, and there's going to be a signal. I know that you know the ER when you take those kids, um, you have to go to generalizing and the rest of the generalizing is that sometimes you'll be okay with just a single dose you can try to find your treatment the second dose of because you can fake um schedule, you might play and have an answer of what's going on with the child. Um, the second comment about the appropriate is on performance control. So this is a test that we're still trying to learn about in pediatrics. There's obviously a lot of data in adults <coughs> in pediatrics. So we're seeing a lot of false positives. So the negative predictive value of this test is probably helpful. The positive predictive value is a good question. So my point is that if you see a positive low acid moment, that does not confirm that there's bacteria in substance. Um, but again, I mean that, you know, um, we're still waiting for more data to come up from pediatrics. I'll just do a quick plug for emergency departments. So they actually are um, conducting a, a large study um, looking at procalcitonin and um, you know what is an appropriate what what do we play as um, you know slam dunk for yes you have concern for SBI versus borderline versus low risk and so hopefully that will come out soon. I don't know Zeb if you want to talk yeah, more about. So we've got one more question for you. Um, and uh, I think, so again, this is just a trial. Um, giving the question is the easy part. The hard part for us is having some way to uh, track you and, uh, and count your questions over the course of the year. So we may uh, try a few different things, um, but uh, we're trying with, with the uh, poll everywhere today. So uh, briefly, uh, if you're gonna go for the uh, 
part two credit, you uh, uh, text your first name the same, uh, just the same uh, way you've been texting before. And when you're done with that, then you can uh, text your last name. And then when you're done with that, uh, this also may be the rate limiting step for some of you. If you have your uh, American Board of Pediatrics number uh, handy, please uh, type that in. And then uh, lastly, before we get to the question, date of birth. Don't worry about the format here. This is just for us to, um, this will get uploaded into a spreadsheet for us. So month, day, and year. And uh, if you guys are ready, we'll go on to the question. Hold it one second. See how the word percentage is already there. What's that? Okay. We're going to actually reset this question so you can text it in again. Okay. All right. So I'll just read it here. You're caring for a 25 day old male who presented to the emergency department with fever of 39.3. The patient underwent a full Sepsis evaluation as CBC and CRP were elevated. Today, today the lab notifies you that the patient's blood culture is positive. What is the most likely bacterial pathogen? Looks like uh, you guys were all listening so far, 100%. Again, if you answer this incorrectly, we're gonna reset the question uh, when we're done here, but so far we only have one response, or at least one one item, B was the response. Cool, thank you guys. Thanks Dr. Callahan.